my buddy there, if, you, if you're looking for more people to talk to, his name is his last name is Ludwig, L-U-D-W-I-G. He's at the University of Chicago. Okay. He's um, he heads up um, this thing that they call the Crime Lab, which is actually a bunch of researchers who study violence and violence prevention. Um, he's an economist by training, but he's a really smart guy, really interesting guy. Okay. Um, and he is heading up this team of people that's evaluating and becoming a man. Okay. Pretty cool. Yeah. 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 And they, they don't have any connection with the, the Interrupters, that program. No. Okay. No. That's yeah. a great That's a great film. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's made by my former partner. From uh, oh, is that right? Yeah. 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 I like that movie a lot. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Uh, no, I didn't cover any buttons. Absolutely not. Uh, with the Velcro, you mean? Yeah, yeah. there used to be a big switch. Oh, no, there's, there's a switch on the back. Hold on. I'll pull it. You sure? Yeah, I'm pretty positive. I don't think so. I think there's a, there is a zoom yeah. lock. Yeah, it's under there. I got covered somehow. so good that we didn't have a chance to look at the trailer or at least have a sense of the thrust of the project. Right. Uh, you know, because what I'm really interested in today is, is in hearing from you about the science of the adolescent brain and how that supports or doesn't support my thesis about teens needing uh, healthy rites of passage and mentorship in order to accomplish that transition into young adulthood. Right. Uh, so, um, <coughs> so please... Uh, let's, First, just say your name, though, and uh, spell it for us, so we'll have my transcriber get it absolutely right. And then also, uh, the title that you'd most like to be identified with through the lower third. Right, okay. So my name is Lawrence Steinberg, L-A-U-R-E-N-C-E-S-T-E-I-N-B-E-R-G, and I'm professor of psychology at Temple University and the author of Age of Opportunity, Lessons from the New Science of Adolescence. Okay. And if we had to choose, because we probably can't get both of those things in a title underneath your name, which one would you prefer us to use? I professor guess professor. I guess the professor. Professor. Okay. Well, the, yeah, because they can always find the book by looking up me as a professor, but not the other way around necessarily. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. <clears throat> so you know, one of the things that I read uh, was that it was your, actually your son's experience that started you off on this journey to some extent. Uh, you know, well, tell us about that. Um, I will with the caveat that it doesn't make it into the film because we have an agreement that oh. I don't tell that story anymore oh. for public. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, then fine. Then let's forget it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was your son's request? Yeah, yeah. He, he, well, he, I, I honor you for honoring his request. Well, he went back on it for the book, but I had been using it in talks for a while, and he finally said, you know, you know the story. And I read about it, yeah. So he... he um, uh, has been working as an editor at Random House for a number of years. And I was interviewed for a profile in the New York Times, and I told that story, and they reprinted it. it yeah. yeah, and the next day, his boss, who's a very prominent editor, um, you know, comes in, Bob Loomis comes in and says to him, oh, so I didn't know you were a peeping Tom when you were a teenager, and so that, so Ben said, no more, you know. Got it. Right, okay. anyway. No problem. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's just launch into talking about brain science and, sure. and the development of the pre frontal cortex right. with teens and, and how that reinforces notions 
uh, of their incomplete development and, and actually puts them more at risk for risky behavior. Right. So um, the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that sits right behind your forehead. Um, it's the CEO of the brain. It's the part that is most crucial for things like decision making and planning and judgment. It's also really important for self-control and self-regulation. Um, that's one of the last parts of the brain to mature. And adolescence is a time when it is developing. It develops very gradually. It's quite protracted and it doesn't really finish maturing um, totally until the early 20s. It matures in phases. By the time people are 15 or 16, the prefrontal cortex in and of itself is comparable to that of an adult. Um, but what continues to develop after that age are connections between the prefrontal cortex and other parts of the brain, especially connections between that part of the brain and parts of the brain that are important for emotions and for, um, for social information. Um, so even though when we, when we test kids who are 15 on sort of straightforward tests of reasoning abilities, let's say, or basic intellectual capacities. They look just like adults. Um, but they're not like adults when we test them on things like impulse control, because that requires the connections between the prefrontal cortex and um, the emotion centers and reward centers of the brain to be fully mature. Um, <clears throat> Self-regulation, self-control is probably the most important characteristic to continue developing during adolescence. And it is critical for success in the world, especially today. There have been hundreds of studies done that show that kids who have stronger self-control do better in school and in work and they have better relationships and they're less prone to emotional and behavioral problems. So that means that anything that we can do as adults to sort of strengthen the functioning of this part of the brain and the systems that it's a part of will really be helpful to young people. Um. Possibility that um, uh, you know that that rites of passage or mentoring could affect th those connections between the prefrontal cortex and the other parts of the brain. I mean, physiologically, I assume no. But well, let's talk about how the brain gets built. I mean, because that's really what we're asking here. Um, the 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 brain responds to novelty and challenge. There's a a word that psychologists use called scaffolding, um, which involves demanding just a tiny bit more from somebody than what he has already proven capable of being, you know, of, of being able to do. Um, if the demands far exceed the capabilities, um, that doesn't work because the person tends to withdraw and disengage. If the demands don't exceed the capabilities, then they don't do anything really. So. The prefrontal cortex is going to develop by challenging kids um, a little bit, bit by bit. And where I think mentors can play a really important role here is that they're probably better at scaffolding kids' experiences than other people might be. That is, if, that is if, they, if they have a lot of experience working as mentors, then they've probably gotten a good sense of what it takes to, to challenge you know, a, a young person to think a little bit more deeply about something or a little bit harder um, about something. So I'm not so sure about rites of passage in and of themselves. Um, in fact, I would guess that they probably don't do, you know, a great deal for the brain. But I do think that mentoring um, does stimulate brain development when it's done well. Yeah, it's interesting because rite of passage by definition almost, it seems to me, would fall into that category of too great a challenge. But in fact, what happens, and by rite of passage, let me just throw out some examples so you have a sure. better sense of what I'm talking about. So, you know, traditional Native American rite of passage could involve vision quests. For right. Mm -hmm. So three days of sitting on a hill fasting and praying, no water, no food, nothing, you know, um, and for a vision to inform your life. Uh, it could involve uh, something as simple as a 48-hour weekend workshop. Right. Uh, it could involve, um, uh, gosh, there are so many. Uh, uh, you know, for a lot of young Thai people, for example, it's considered uh, 
culturally uh, necessary that you actually do a year of service in a Buddhist monastery. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's your rite of passage. And, and I'm told that young women in Thailand will not marry a man uh, mm. smart, who hasn't been to that. So at any rate, so there's significant challenges with this one. Right. And, and yet, they, more often than not, the young people rise to these challenges right. and come out of it significantly altered. Uh, right. So, so let's, astu let's assume that societies over time have figured out what the challenge should be, right? I mean, because these rites of passage evolved over a long period of time, and there probably was a lot of trial and error. I mean, I can imagine that, that some societies tried to get young people to do things that they couldn't do, and then they said, well, this is not the task that we should have as the rite of passage. Um, or they did some where it didn't challenge the young person enough, and it was too simple, not, not demanding enough. And they said, well, we need to tweak it up a little bit. So I'm, I'm assuming that, that the, the specifics that developed over time were done by different societies because they worked in, in, in some way. Um, I mean, let's remember that, yes, th there are rites of passage that are purely ceremonial and, and symbolic, um, right? I mean, where we, we change the way the person looks. Um, or we change what the person wears, or where the person is allowed to, to go, or things like that. Right. But then there are rites of passage that are more like training, right. Um, right? And in fact, there are lots of societies where there really are two rites of passage. There's one marking the beginning of the training period, and there's one marking the end of the training, the completion of the training period, right? So it's not, I, I think most people don't really fully understand this. I think they think, oh, well, there's some ceremony um, where, you know, where, they bless you and they paint you and they do whatever to you and then now you're a, an adult. But that's not really how it works. Uh, I mean, there, there usually is some kind of expectation that you will, you will demonstrate your maturity or your capability or your responsibility in some way. Yeah. Angeli Varian, the, the noted uh, anthropologist, multiculturalist, uh, I don't know if you know her name at all, but uh, she said at its most simple level that basically it's, about learning a skill and demonstrating that skill. That's right. You know, uh, but um, the, the 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 just to to emphasize this. Although we tend to look at these rites of passage, um, thinking about the ceremony as the important part, that's not really the important part. The important part is the training and the education. Exactly, and it, it, one of the points that my film is going to make very clear is I'm going to, in a sense, reappropriate this term. I want to uh, appropriate it out of its common usage in the culture, which can mean turning 18, getting your driver's license, getting to vote for the first time, drink for the first, have sex for the first, you know, all of that, which I would call neutral, that don't have that transformative capacity, and then the negative rites of passage, which. Uh, do transform people, but to negative ends. Right. Uh, fraternity hazing, um, uh, gang banging, bullying can right. often be seen in that way. That's so right. I think it's important to, to reappropriate that term. Right. And, and I think the reappropriation of it has to include developing an understanding of the, of the purpose of it, which is not simply to mark somebody as having you know, become recognized as an adult. But, but it's to, to see that somebody is, is prepared, you know, for adulthood. Um, and I mean, we have, in that sense, we have rites of passage here. I mean, we call them high, we call it high school. Um, you know, it doesn't work particularly well, but, you, you know, I mean, in theory, you enter in as a child or as a, you know, pre-adolescent, and you're supposed to emerge as someone that has a set of skills that enables you to participate as an adult member of society. Um, I mean, in, you know, ultimately that's why we have secondary education. Now, it, it sort of lost its function in that respect. Maybe we can restore that, you know, a little bit. Well, and forgive me if I go too sort of cosmological no, no, that's right. here, but, and again, most of my studies over the last 15, 20 years in this area come out of, uh, either sort of neo-Jungian uh, thinking or um, uh, mythopoetic mm -hmm. schools, you know. But, you know, there's a number of, of things that are really 
byproducts of a proper healthy rite of passage for young people. One is they have a deep sense of their meaning in, in their life, mm -hmm. the purpose, what they're here to do. You know, and I have a strong feeling that each individual on the planet has some unique purpose, if you will, and that they that it's their job to discover that purpose. But it's our job as elders, if you will, to help the young people discover that, and that's what a rite of passage accomplishes. And that's just actually one of many different uh, right. skill sets, I think. Uh, I'll just mention a couple more, and then I, I'm curious about your response. But uh -huh. to learn their physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional capacity so that they have a deep sense of what those limitations are so that they don't need to seek them out through unconscious trial you know, of drinking and driving or whatever you want to name, you know. Uh, and also to have a, a deep, grounded sense of a place for yourself in the universe, you know, that you belong, if you will. You know, those are some key byproducts, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we've completely lost sight of that, I mean, there's, there's in, you know, in modern society. And could you say what the that is? Because my question is both for you. Oh, sure. I mean, I think we completely lost sight of the importance of changes in people's self-conceptions, really, as a way of, of, of marking a rite of passage, that you then have some better sense of what your place in society is, what your purpose is in some ways. Um, I think, you know, part of that is because in America, we tend to equate work with your purpose. I mean, that's the first thing we typically ask somebody when we meet them, what do you do? Um, and because the connection between high school and work no longer really exists very much, um, high school no longer serves that purpose. You know, I mean, if you ask somebody graduating from high school, what do you, what do you want to be? Um, you don't really take it all that seriously because you know, well, there's going to be at least four more years where the person is going to be studying for something like that. Um, and, and, and I don't think that we, we don't spend a lot of time with young people getting them to think really about who they are and, and what they're going to become. I think they think about that, um, but we don't guide them in it at all. And that, it seems to me, is what's missing um, that we maybe could restore. And that's what I think a good mentor does. But it's, but it's, part, of, it's part of a bigger problem, in my view, which is that we don't think about positive development during adolescence. We only think about th problems and things that can go wrong, right? And so if you, if you, if you went to a bookstore and uh, let's say that you were the parent of an adolescent and you wanted to do this for your child, right? Um, you couldn't find any advice or guidance on it. If you went to a bookstore and you picked up a book on, on raising teenagers, most likely the book would have something like survive or survival in the title of it. And, and I think that that's how we've come to think about adolescence, not as a time for growth, but as something that you endure and that if you get through alive, you know, then, then you've succeeded either as a young person or as a parent. And, you know, the whole message of my book is that adolescence is an opportunity and we're not taking advantage of the opportunity. And it's an opportunity because the brain is very plastic and very malleable at this time. Um, but in order to take advantage of the opportunity, we need to provide challenge and, and, and stimulation and, and, and scaffolded learning, which is what a mentor can do. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. <clears throat> but uh, part of the fault of the culture, too, is in supporting parents in, in not only in, in, in sort of setting up that scaffolding, but but also knowing when to cut it. In other words, when to cut what we would call the sort of the second umbilical cord, if you will, the symbolic one in order to release, you know, bless that young person and release him or her into the outer world. Knowing in effect that your job as a parent now is primarily over. You know, we don't, we don't have cultural support to mark those moments in time or rituals to support parents through that. Yeah, I, you know, I think that, and I say this as the parent of a 30-year-old, um, that your job as parent isn't really over. I mean, it's changed, you know, in, in, in lots of ways. But I still think that people in, in the age period of their 20s today still need a fair amount of support and guidance from their parents, 
because of the nature of modern society. Yeah, well, that's interesting because that's one of the questions I had for you. I mean, a, a friend of mine recently said, you know, 20 somethings are the new teens. And I, I think, you know, the, yeah, yeah. brain development aside, I mean, sociologically, I think that's true partly because uh, the, of the protectiveness that they've grown up with that's very different from our generation, Bill. Right. Um, I don't know if I would phrase it just as the 20 year olds are the new teens, but I would say certainly that adolescence has been extended and the passage into adulthood has been delayed. Um, I think not because parents are coddling kids or spoiling them, which is what you often read, and not because 20 somethings are lazy or self absorbed or narcissistic. I mean, I think that the, the changes in the labor force and in the economy have made it important that people stay in school for much longer. And, you know, we, we call it a four-year college degree, but it takes people six years on average to finish it. Um, and that means that people are, are, people are going to have to be in school until they're 20 or 4 or 25 in order to be able to get a college degree, which is now a requisite for a decent paying job in the United States. And if people need to stay in school for that long, um, then they're going to be financially dependent on their parents for a longer period of time. Um, but, but I don't, but I, I think that young people have kind of gotten an unfair rap about this. And, you know, they're, they're, they're being portrayed as if they're, they're happy that this is the way, you know, that it is. Um, well, my, my, my purpose is not to make them wrong in some Yeah, way. you know, I know, you know right. It's, and, it's, and frankly, I, I would argue that that issue of what I call suspended adolescent behavior, that goes on well beyond the 20s. Yes. I mean, we see a lot of adults, I think, acting out their, their teenage appetites and their teenage fears in 40, 50, 60, and 70-year-old bodies. I mean, to my way of thinking, that actually accounts for a lot of the dysfunctional behavior at institutional levels. Uh, but maybe that's a separate issue. But uh, do you want to respond to that? Well, I mean, I, th I think if, if we're confused as a society about what is an adolescent and what is an adult, because we don't have clear and, and distinct markers of that, then you will see a lot of pseudo-adult behaviors performed by adolescents and a lot of adolescent behaviors engaged in by adults because I think that the, that the distinction between the two um, has kind of been lost. I mean, look at how people dress, uh, you know, I mean, that you see adults dressing the way that we expect kids to dress. And on the other hand, particularly with young girls, you see them being hypersexualized and and dressing in ways that we used to consider only appropriate for you know a, a, a sexually mature adult to dress in with cosmetics and, and and so on. So I think we're kind of blurring a lot of these lines, and I think that that makes that makes the creation of a, an intelligent rite of passage more difficult because we're confused about what the beginning point is and you know what the ending point is. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's funny, when I give public talks about this in my PowerPoint, uh, my poster boy for this is Charlie Sheen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's maybe an easy target, but frankly, I see it endemic across the social landscape in corporations and government, et cetera. It's like adolescent behavior. Right, but, but, but at the same time, um, it, you know, it looks to me th that a lot of the most successful companies in America now are either being they're, if they're not being run by people that are in this kind of nebulous age period, they're certainly being driven by a lot of their talents and a lot of their energy. I mean, look at places like Google and M Microsoft and Facebook and stuff. I mean, that's and, and look at how the work environments of those places are different from the conventional work environments. They're much more like places that adolescents would like to hang out. I mean, I mean, foosball and, um, you know, and, and candy. I mean, what is more sort of adolescent than eating candy and playing, you know, pinball or, you know, whatever. So, uh, you know, so I, th I think, again, there's this blur that is going on between, you know, what's an adolescent and what's an adult. 
Um, now, I think that I think ultimately the question is whether that blur is a terrible thing. I mean, conventionally, when I teach adolescent development, which I've been doing for nearly 40 years now, um, the, the, there, there is a theory that goes back to the anthropologist Ruth Benedict, um, who preceded Margaret Mead, um, that, that the passage into adulthood um, needs two features in order for it to work, clarity and continuity. So it needs to be clear, that is, people need to be certain of who's an adolescent and who's an adult, and the young person needs to be certain of when he or she's become an adult. Um, and, um, and in terms of the continuity, it needs to be progressive. And so you need to be schooled up to it. So we don't all of a sudden um, hide things from you and then expose you to them and say, okay, now you have to be able to do this. So if we think in, in American society um, that we, we, we typically don't, we, there are subjects that are taboo. I mean, it doesn't typically work this way, but we, we, we actually try to hide sex from kids. And that's why we have movie ratings that don't let them see sex in, in, in movies. And then all of a sudden, you magically reach the age of 17 and it's okay you know, to see this. And, and Benedict, as an anthropologist, would look at that and say, that's completely wrong. I mean, kids should be progressively exposed to sexuality from the time they're younger so that they're not surprised by it when they become adults. Another example of that is child care. It used to be the case when we lived in extended families and were more agrarian that, that children had experience in holding infants and taking care of them and helping with that so that when they themselves became parents, they had some talent for doing this because they'd been gradually socialized into this adult role. Well, we don't do that anymore because of the nature of, of family life. So for, for lots of people, when they have a baby is the first time they've ever taken care of a baby. Um, and uh, of course, that's got to make it tougher to do than if you had been sort of gently and progressively taught how to do this. And so it was very interesting. I, <clears throat> again, when I do public talks on it, I mean, what, all of my studies seem to point to two factors that are different factors, okay. but nonetheless, parallel or maybe analogous in some ways, but, you know, to, to accomplishing that separation from adolescence to young adulthood, one is leaving home, so in effect, uh, sometimes physically, but at least psychologically, mm -hmm. being able to make that break with mom and dad, you know, that's what I meant in a sense by cutting the second umbilical cord, and the second is facing death, you know, that, that um, a lot of indigenous peoples at least felt like if, if we can't bring the person into the proximity of death so that they can really face it, then they won't have the psychological capacity to actually face coming challenges in the rest of their life because they'll crumble in the face of them. But if once they face th their own death and they have an acceptance of that as absolutely normal and fine, then they will actually operate much more effectively. Yeah, the facing death one is kind of tricky because in a lot of indigenous, you know, cultures, people don't live that long, not as long as we live, you know, in, in the developed world. Um, so I'm not so sure about the value of facing death when you're 18 if you're going to live to be 80. It's a pretty far off, and we know that adolescents have a difficult time thinking far ahead into the future. They tend to be more short-term in the way that they're oriented to the world. And if anything, I think that people would say that, that kids growing up in urban, you know, disadvantaged communities face a lot of death. I mean, they, they, they're exposed to a lot of violence. They know people who've been killed. They hear gunshots. Um, and that we think it's not good f for them. But, but maybe it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is that Facing death in a way where you're guided through it by somebody who's wiser than you are is very different than facing it all by yourself as a kid. Because I think that we think, and I think we know, that exposure to that kind of violence and trauma when you're young can create, if not full-blown PTSD, then certainly symptoms of it. So, uh, you know, it's... Yes. I think that's a very useful distinction, absolutely, between uh, low-income folks of color, largely in urban areas, as opposed to others. 
But uh, this is, I, I hope I'm not taking it too far afield from the stuff I, I, I want to just get back to. But, you know, I have a theory about, uh, you know, the mass shootings in places like Columbine mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and in and Connecticut, you know, um, that, it's, and it's largely upper middle class white boys, you know, doing these kinds of things. It's right. rarely uh, low income kids of color right. uh, doing it. Uh, that, you know, given the fact that there are no uh, culturally sanctioned rites of passage for them to cross into young adulthood, that they're so desperate to prove that they're men, that this is their uh, completely dysfunctional way of actually trying to do that. Because they're, what they're doing is not only they're, they're, they're facing their own death a, a, along with causing other people's death, and of course, they're just imitating it from what they see in popular culture, and that's why it's so dysfunctional. But I, I believe that at some pervert, deep level, that they're actually trying to prove that they're men. I think I disagree. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, I think that in a lot of these these cases, it's turned out. And please state what we're talking. These oh, cases. sure. In 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 a lot of cases of mass shootings that have taken place, um, it, it, it turns out that that the person was mentally ill or close to being mentally ill or associated with somebody who was mentally ill. So I don't think that it is uh, a deliberate attempt to prove, you know, that, that you're an adult in, in, in some way. I mean, However, I, unconscious, that deliberate. Yes. I'm, I, I, I still don't think that it's even an unconscious attempt to prove that you're um, an adult. I think in, in the case of Columbine, I think it was a sort of retaliatory in some ways for having been excluded and having been, you know, bullied um, or ostracized in some way. In Connecticut, I mean, I think that this young man was probably, if, if not full-blown schizophrenic, had something, psych, you know, some sort of psychosis. So, um, I mean, if anything, I think a lot of the a lot of the shooting that goes on in inner city. Um, altercations might be a, a demonstration or a show of power or dominance or or manhood in, in some ways. But I don't think that that's the case for the mass shootings. Hmm. Okay, well, I'll be curious what you think. Uh, I have in my film Boys to Men, Yeah. Uh, I filmed a young man as, uh, who came from an upper middle class Jewish family outside of Newark, uh, south, in one of the uh, West Orange, I think it was. Anyway, he, he, to my way of thinking, fit the psycho profile of the, what I understand the Columbine killers to be like because he was bullied all his life. Mm -hmm. He was a schlubby, overweight kid who was kept out of physical activities and was not socialized with his peers, etc., etc. So right on, all he did was fantasize about walking into school and shooting everybody. Right. And that's all he thought about. Uh, so... Anyway, I, at the very least, I think that there are a lot more kids out there like that than we as a society care to really fully recognize and appreciate. Well, right, but I think that I think the distinction that we need to grapple with is whether kids who engage in these kinds of violent acts um, are, are, are doing something that serves a normal purpose. Um, or whether they're doing something that that is abnormal in in some way, and I tend to think the latter, uh, you know, about this. I, I you know, that that, that so I, I agree with the basic premise that we don't have many options for young people to display when they're ready to be adults, um, and that some will resort to, um, you know, what I would call pseudo adult behavior in order to to demonstrate that. But I think shooting people, you know, is sort of a, a, a different thing I entirely. A, a whole different level beyond sort of impulse control into some form of mental illness. Right. I mean, I, th I think that the, 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 for what it's worth, the National Academy of Sciences did a, an analysis of, the, of many of the, ma of the mass killings that took place in schools. And, and their conclusion was that very frequently there was some kind of mental illness present plus peer rejection, plus the easy access to, you know, to, to firearms. Okay. Well, um, let's, let's talk about um, uh, Im 
impulse control. Um, let's see. Or should our understanding of brain development and this impulse control issue uh, impact our thinking about decriminalizing youthful behavior? Yeah. Um, well, I think that our understanding of adolescent brain development should really inform the way in which we treat kids who come into contact with the justice system, um, who've, who've violated the law in some way and committed a serious crime. Um, you know, for, for starters, if kids are still developing self-regulation and, and impulse control, um, then they're less responsible for their behavior than, than adults are, um, j just inherently less responsible. Um, and and under, under our criminal law, the degree to which you're responsible for a crime that you've committed is supposed to affect the way in which we respond to it. It's supposed to mitigate your culpability and reduce the degree of punishment that you get for it. Um, and I've argued, as well as many of my colleagues, that um, we ought to treat adolescents as, as having diminished responsibility for their behavior. And we shouldn't punish them the way that we punish adults, even if they've committed the same crimes. I was called, actually, this morning by a public defender from Colorado who's defending, um, uh, involved in a case in, in which an 18-year-old girl and a 19-year-old boy committed a pretty bad homicide. And the prosecutor there wants the death penalty for them. And, you know, she called me because she said, can you help us, you know, convince the court that even though they're legally adults, because they're both 18 or, or older, um, they're neurobiologically still developing. And, you know, the, the Supreme Court, of course, now thankfully ruled that the death penalty is unconstitutional for juveniles. It took us a very long time to get there, and we were the last civilized society in the world to, to get there. Um, and, 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 and they've reached similar decisions about life without parole for kids as, as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, again, it raises these very difficult questions about how do we judge whether you're an adult or not? Um, it, you know, clearly what the brain science says is that it doesn't make a lot of sense to just pick some arbitrary chronological age and say, when you've reached that age now, you're an adult. So in some regards, um, you, you know, um, in, in, in some regards, earlier societies had a better idea about that, which was to evaluate you on the basis of what you could do, to evaluate you to see whether you had the maturity and the responsibility um, of an adult. And only then would we confer that status to you. I get asked all the time whether we can look at somebody's brain and tell whether it's a mature brain or not. And we can't. Um, you know, and, and I don't think we probably ever will be able to do that. I mean, never say never, but um, I, th I think that would be very, very challenging to do. So we tend to look in our society for quick answers, easy answers to things. Okay, well, we'll just say you're an adult if you're 18. That way we don't have to worry about measuring your capability or your maturity. Or, you know, well, look at your brain, take a picture of your brain and say, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's immature and yours, yours is mature, so, you know, you're an adult and this other person isn't an adult. I mean, if you think about it, to have a rite of passage that involves preparing somebody for adulthood and then doing some consensual evaluation, right, of the community, of whether this person has fulfilled the requirements. That's, that takes a lot of time, uh, you know, and, and I would guess on a large scale with, you know, millions and millions of people, it would be quite expensive to do. So, it, 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 you know, it may be in some ways unrealistic to expect that a large industrialized society can, can do something that mimics con conventional rites of passage. But maybe we can come up with our own way of doing it that, that fits with modern life. Well, exactly, and I, and I think that, and I'm, I'm an idealist, admittedly, so yeah. uh, so I always aim for the, the, the sky, but, uh, but I think that, and I've seen it happen, where communities basically come together and then they uh, affect 
actively co-create something that's u geographically and culturally specific right. for their young people. Uh, there was a community in um, <coughs> um, uh, one of the canyons outside of LA where they decided the, uh, that the young people needed to face uh, the fears of the ocean as a, as, a, <laughs> as a way to do it. And they actually taught them to surf uh, because they, they were not on the beach. They were in the canyon. And so they had to get out of that canyon wow. and face. So it was beautiful. I, I, I would still be an adolescent if that was the criteria. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Great. Yeah. Uh, no question. I'm kind of vestibularly challenged, you know. Uh, I, I yeah. Said, yeah. No, I, I failed miserably <laughs> standing up on a surfboard the one time I tried. But uh, well, well, let's talk about um, uh, well, it's the sort of the negative side of you know dis so-called dysfunctional youthful behavior. But I, w I want you to to make it clear how widespread the landscape. Sure. That in fact, that it's not because it drives me crazy that we have these categories of at-risk kids. Frankly, I personally consider all kids to be at risk. So across the socioeconomic spectrum, basically, that's right. my feeling. But yeah. So I mean, if you look at at different kinds of risk behavior during adolescence, this is the time when these behaviors typically reach their peak. You know, sometime in in, in late adolescence, late teen years, or early twenties. And this is true for a very wide range of things that cut across socioeconomic boundaries. Um, even crime, you know, I mean, there's a disproportionate arrest rate for kids of color and kids in poor communities. But if you do studies where you actually ask kids what they've done, not whether they've been arrested for it, those differences are pretty small. I mean, virtually, I think it's something like 80% of American males have done something by the age of 18 that they could have been arrested for. Um, but, you know, we have policing practices that, that differ from community to community, and the way that, that courts treat kids, you know, differ as a function of their families and so on. So, um, but, and, and if you look at different at, at rates of drug use, um, what you see really more is that the drugs of choice differ for. Um, you know, different segments of society, but that kids in general are experimenting, you know, with drugs that are illegal for them to use. Um, and, you know, in, in the United States, um, we have very high rates of binge drinking um, compared to other parts of the world, marijuana use compared to other parts um, of the world, uh, and, um, and, and of other risk behaviors as well, unprotected sex, um, is relatively high here compared to other parts of the world, um, uh, and 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 uh, certainly violence and and juvenile criminal behavior. So it is um, it is a a potentially dangerous time that is a a adolescence in in America is. Yeah, um, are you still getting the different frameworks? statistics is actually that the potential for drug and alcohol abuse is commensurate with the income of the family. So that the, the higher the income, the greater the likelihood that there would be drug and alcohol abuse for the I, teen. I think that drug and alcohol abuse m may be higher for more affluent kids. Um, you know, for some obvious reasons. You know, one is that these things cost money and you know, they, they have more discretionary income. Um, and, of course, their parents are using a lot of these substances, too. So um, they, they not only see role models of people using these substances, but they have access to them around the house, too. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people have said this. We do, we do send out ambivalent messages to, to kids about the use of these substances. I mean, if you watch, you know, Monday Night Football, you see these commercials of people drinking beer and having fun, and the underlying message is that this is the way that people have fun. Um, and then, you know, to then go to, to say to kids in school, you don't need to drink to have fun, it, it kind of conflicts with, you know, with these other 
the messages. So, um, it, you know, it, it's tough. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, well, we, we sort of touched on this, but maybe this is a different way of, of, of addressing the same issue. But so you know, again, I, I tend to think of uh, kids, uh, teens, thrill-seeking behavior at some level as an attempt at self-initiation, at, at an, as an attempt, however unconscious and dysfunctional, to determine something of what their limits are. Um, do you, what's yeah. your take on that? So, the, so, the, so there's a theory out there um, developed by a psychologist whose name is Terry Moffat, who teaches at Duke now. Um, of, of, she, she focused her theory mainly on criminal sensation seeking, um, but I think it applies to other kinds as well. Um, uh, she distinguished between what she calls life course persistent offending and adolescence limited offending. So if you look at kids who commit crimes, um, most of them stop when they're young adults. Very, very few crimes are committed by people over the age of 25. I mean, the peak rate, the peak arrest rate is like at 18. Or so, um, but most people stop, and, and and then you have this small minority of people, maybe between five and ten percent of 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 people who commit crimes who continue to commit crimes as adults. But it's really pretty, pretty small. Um, and so then the question is, what is it about adolescence limited, you know, effect? Why? I mean, why do kids do this? If they're going to stop, why do they start? And her theory is that they do it to demonstrate adulthood. They do it to demonstrate m maturity. Um, and, and sometimes it's very explicit. I mean, if you're in a gang and you may have a task that you're supposed to do, kind of sounds like a rite of passage in a way, but it's a dysfunctional one. Um, but, but other times it's implicit, where um, it just is a thing that people do. Like I know a lot of kids um, who've shoplifted because um, it was a way of sort of being with the crowd and doing what everybody did. And they actually might even tell stories about what they got away with um, as a way of indicating, um, I guess, in some senses, their bravery. I mean, I, I mean, we could interpret it that way. And, and you know, and, and maybe if we had other ways for kids to, to illustrate um, th their adult-like qualities, that they wouldn't resort to these um, anti-social ones. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, this also circles back in, in, a, in a way to sort of the community responsibility, the adults' responsibility, the elders, if you will. You know, <clears throat> Michael Mead, do you know his work at all by any chance? Michael Meany? Michael Mead. Mead, no. Okay. Um, he, he's a collaborator. He's out, comes out of the Mitchell Poetic Movement with Robert Bly okay. and, and some of these other people. Um, anyway, he, he everybody knows, you know, it, it takes uh, the, the, the maxim, you know, it takes a whole village to raise a child. And, you know, he's inverted that, I think, quite beautifully. And he says, well, yeah, but it also takes the struggles of youth to create a, a village. And I, I think that that is beautifully apt mm -hmm. because... There are so many ways that we are failing our young people. Right. And to me, you know, not addressing their need for initiation, for uh, mentorship is, is part of that. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Or? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think that we, um, we are not addressing the needs of young people. Um, and we, we have taken away, I think, from many of them opportunities to participate meaningfully in the community, um, which, which does two things. I mean, the first is that it, it deprives them of this chance to understand themselves better and to develop a sense of, of, of being important. Uh, I mean, to use a non-technical word, I would just say mattering. And, and, and mattering is really important at that age. And if we don't allow you to do anything that demonstrates that you matter, um, you know, that's taking away something that, that, that could um, otherwise contribute to your positive development. But then I think we also have to ask, what's the community losing by 
by not engaging young people in, in, in this. Um, we, we do engage them when we need them to go to war because we know that they're willing to take a lot of risks, you know, because of the way the adolescent brain is wired. I mean, we've been enlisting young people as warriors for a, a very, very long time, long before, of course, we were doing brain scans and long before we understood the fact that risk taking during adolescence is hardwired. We've always known that in some ways. Um, so when we need them, um, we're, we'll call on them, you know, to, to do those things. Um, but when we don't need them, we're kind of at a loss, right, as to, well, what should we be doing? Uh, you know, I mean, somehow working behind the counter of a fast food restaurant doesn't quite strike me as, uh, as something that's going to make you feel as if you really matter. Yeah. You know, the, Reed has another quote that comes to mind, and I'm paraphrasing now, but it's um, a, a community that doesn't uh, nurture its own young people into their own fullness is cutting off the wellsprings of its own existence. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, so, so I think we should be having, a, a, you know, a, a broader discussion as, as the adults in society as to what we're missing by not engaging adolescence. Um, now, I, I, I want to say something that I think is important to, to say. I am not somebody who thinks that, that adolescents are adults in disguise and that we should stop, you know, infantilizing them and, and making them into young people. They are different. And, and we, I mean, they're different neurobiologically, and they're different psychologically, and they have different needs. Th there is a, a, a kind of anti-brain science movement in the field of people who are saying that all this is just nonsense, that, that we're, we're, it's just another way to oppress young people by, you know, by portraying them as, as, as still needing to, to grow up brain-wise. I don't believe that for a second. I mean, I, I think the neuroscience is there and the brain is still maturing during adolescence in important ways. So when I, when I think we need to find ways for adolescents to feel like they matter, I don't mean that we should treat them as if they're adults. I mean we should find ways for adolescents to do things so that they feel that they matter. And those things may be different from what we, um, what, what we expect adults to do. Uh, it, it may be being in positions where you're training for adulthood, like an apprentice. Um, it may be in positions where you're contributing kind of under the guidance and tutelage of a mentor. Um, but I don't think that we should pretend for a moment that people go from childhood to adulthood without this other stage in, in between. That's so interesting you say that, though, because uh, I've read somewhere, I wish I could remember where, but that, that, uh, it was relatively recent, this term, adolescence came into being and, and, and common usage like a hundred years ago or so roughly and that that most indigenous cultures on the planet I mean really there was no sense of adolescence of this in between time if you will that was really childhood you're either a child or you're an adult I think I think that's I think that's what many people have written I don't think it's true I, I'll tell you why I don't think it's true you can go back to Aristotle um, and read things that he's written about the young. And he's not talking about children. You, you can read, there's a great quote from The Winter's Tale, from Shakespeare, where um, uh, uh, the person says, I wish there were no age between 10 and 23. Um, because all people do during that phase is get into fights um, and, and disrespect their elders and, and so on. So... And, th and that was, you know, in the 1600s. Uh, so, uh, I mean, this idea that adolescence is a modern invention, I, I think, just doesn't fly. Even in indigenous cultures, the fact that they have the beginning of a training period and the end of a training period means that they have a separate stage that's between childhood and adulthood. Now, it may be a brief stage, and we can talk about that because adolescence lasts so much longer now than it did um, previously, even in industrialized society for uh, a number of reasons. But uh, the way in which we have created modern adolescence may be an invention. 
But as a distinct stage, separate from childhood and adulthood, it has always been there. And it's there in other species, too. Really? Yes. That's right. Yeah. So here are some um, uh, uh, interesting examples. Um, if you give mice alcohol, and, and there are strains of mice that drink alcohol, um, if they're juvenile mice, that is, if they've recently gone through puberty, it makes them gregarious and they want to hang around with other mice. If you give adult mice the same amount of alcohol, they want to be by themselves. If you give juvenile mice alcohol, they, get, they, they don't get hung over. But if you give adult mice alcohol, they do get hung over. That is, they perform worse on cognitive tasks the, the, the next day. We did an experiment at Temple where we raised mice in, in essentially we created peer groups of mice. We, we took three mice from three different litters and we put them together in a cage after they were weaned and they grew up together as a little group. And then we, we tested them either as juveniles or as adults. Juveniles meaning right at the time they had just gone through puberty, which is about 30 days in the life of a mouse. Um, and, and the test was to see how much alcohol they would drink um, if given unlimited access to it. And we tested half of the sample alone and half of them with their two peers in the cage with them at the same time. So the adolescent mice drink much more when they're with their friends than they do when they're alone, but the adult mice drink the same amount when they're with their friends as when they're alone. So there are differences, even in other species, between how juveniles behave um, and, and how um, adults behave. And it's very vivid if you look at other primates. I mean, there's no question about that, that there is an adolescent period in, in other primate species. Yeah, uh, I'm actually reminded of the story of the, of the uh, adolescent elephants in the, in the national park in South yeah. Africa. You, you know that yeah. story I'm referring to, yeah. So when they brought in the older bull elephants, they helped calm down the, the adolescents. Uh, yeah, that's pretty amazing. So, so, so I, saw, um, I saw this report in, uh, on the internet of a, a documentary that was being made by a British filmmaker about dolphins. And one of the things they had captured on film was this very bizarre behavior where the dolphins would chew on a, on a toxic puffer fish. But they would only chew on it for a, a short amount of time, um, and then they would pass it to another dolphin in their, in their group. And when they had um, chewed on this for a, a little bit of a while, it would make them behave as if they were stoned. They, they would stare at their reflection in the water and just stare at themselves, right? So I thought this was really interesting. It made no mention in the article about how old the dolphins were. So I tracked the, the documentarian down, and I wrote to him, and I said, I'm really interested you know, in this. I said, how old were the dolphins? And he wrote back, and he said, they were about the equivalent of human adolescence. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think there are so many examples that adolescence really exists that uh, we should put to rest this idea that it's, What's invented is the way that we do adolescence. But adolescence as a stage has always been there and recognized as such. As a physiological stage? As, 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 as a biological stage, but also as a status transition. I mean, where, you know, where people were identified as being not quite adults and, and you know, in need of, of containment, maybe. I mean, that's what Aristotle wrote about, or in need of, of preparation or training, or ready for preparation or, or training, as in indigenous societies. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, as Louise Mahdi put it in a book that she compiled, The Twixt and Between, you know, that's the name of the book. Right. right. Yeah. Um, somethings being the new teens, but I, I'm curious if, if there's a, a moment that we can define where that uh, that stops being true scientifically, that, that a young person is still in an adolescent stage and only is true sort of psychologically or sociologically. Yeah. Um, 
So the question is whether there are physical markers of, of ceasing to be an adolescent and now being an adult. Um, yes, but they're so varied. So there's a, a process called epiphysis, which is the closing of the ends of bones so that they no longer grow. That's one marker of the end of adolescence, when, when your growth spurt is over and you're not getting any taller. Um, and that's typically 22 or 23? No, that's younger than that. That would be younger than that. Um, y younger than 22 or 23. Um, there's attainment of reproductive capability is another way to think about the end of, of adolescence. So if adolescence starts with the beginning of puberty and then culminates when somebody is capable of sexual reproduction, that's another way to think about this as an adult. Um, when adolescents first get to that point, they go through a period of what we call adolescent subfertility, where they are, you know, where girls are menstruating and, and, and boys are producing semen, um, but where uh, the girl's cycles are irregular enough that um, she would have difficulty getting pregnant. Um, so then when that subfertility phase is over and she's fertile, she's very fertile. Um, that would be kind of in the late teen years. Um, and, then, and then there's the brain science, you, you know, which is what I'm interested in. And, and I think according to the brain science, so, so the, the, as, I, as I think I, I mentioned, um, one of the important developments in the brain in later adolescence is, is the development of more connections between the prefrontal cortex and other parts of the brain. Um, and, and we call that connectivity. And there have been some studies that have measured connectivity in the brain. I mean, you can do it by looking at it structurally or you can do it by looking at patterns of brain activation to see if multiple parts of the brain light up at the same time, then they're connected to each other. Um, and according to the best research on that, there aren't very many improvements in connectivity after age 22 or so. And so that's a reasonable marker of when the brain has reached adult levels. There's still some changes that take place after that, but they're probably not very practically in, in, in important. Um, so I think we can, but they don't all coincide. I mean, one of the challenges in drawing boundaries between adolescence and adulthood, and one of the reasons that we often resort to just using chronological age, is that development during this time period is not synchronized. I mean, you know, you have a separate timetable for brain development and for um, reproductive development, and a separate timetable for emotional development and cognitive development. And, and, and so when people ask me all the time, is, well, when is a person sort of an adult? Um, I, you know, it's like, well, what index do you want to talk about? The, some abilities reach adult levels very early in the adolescent period, and some take a longer time to mature. So it really depends on what you're interested in. And, and do you think that that uh, would correlate in any way meaningfully with someone who has had a rite of passage or a mentorship experience? So, so the question really then, it, it, the question is, um, does treating somebody like an adult help them grow into kind of a physical adulthood. In a sense, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think we know the answer to that. I mean, we, you know, we do know that, that, that demanding things from people that are just a little bit more than what they're capable of doing does stimulate brain development. So to the extent that the mentorship or the rite of passage or the treatment of the young person is stimulating and provides challenge and, and, and novelty, then sure, it could facilitate their maturation into adulthood, but I don't think we really know the answer to that. There's some very curious research showing, and th this, is, this is a very negative thing, but showing that, that girls who've been sexually abused go through puberty earlier than girls who haven't been sexually abused. And there's a kind of example of treating somebody like an adult, that is having sex with them, turning them into an adult faster. There's also this interesting thing that actually we discovered in our lab many, many years ago, which is that 
adolescents who have more distant relationships with their parents go through puberty earlier. Um, and so there's an example of maybe how emotional distance between teenagers and their parents might stimulate faster physical development. Yeah. When we first, when we first found it and, and published it, um, people didn't believe it. It's now been replicated dozens of, of, of times. And actually, um, people who work with, uh, with monkeys know this, that if you, in some, in some species of monkeys, if you house them in, in cages in close proximity with their mothers, it really slows their physical maturation um, tremendously. And when you separate them, then they start to mature uh, pretty rapidly after that. Yeah. Well, it makes implicit sense to me, but then it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the need to uh, break away from mom and dad in order to define the, the end of adolescence. And so if, if those emotional bonds last longer, then that makes that break that much more suspended. Right, and so what do you do? So I think that part of the, part of the challenge for all of us, for parents and for society and for kids, is what do you do as these different markers of maturity become more and more distant from each other, more and more separate from each other. And so, so what happens in a society when people start emancipating themselves emotionally when they're 13 years old, but they have to remain financially dependent on these people that you're trying to emancipate yourself from until you're you know, 25? And, and I think that this poses a challenge in lots of families about who has the right to govern what? Uh, you know, I mean, I think there are parents, I think they're wrong, but I think there are parents who basically say, as, as long as I'm paying for you, I get to call the shots about how you live your life. Um, and that clashes with, with a, a natural inclination of kids to want to be emotionally independent. Not to, not to disavow their parents and not to disrespect them, but to want more privacy and more control over their own day-to-day activities. And I think that now, you know, with more and more adolescents having to move back in home, and it has really raised a lot of issues about negotiating the new rules. And, and you know, there's no, there's, there's no book written on how, to, on how to do this yet. I'm sure somebody will. Um, but uh, I think a lot of families struggle with this. I, I film them every day. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm glad you articulated that yeah. issue. That's but can, can, but can I just say something about the, po- the positive side of this? Yes. I think young people today are much closer to their parents than they were in previous generations, in, 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 a, in a good way, in a way that's friendly and, um, and emotionally attached. Um, and, and so I think that you know, the portrayal of moving back in with your parents, which we see in popular magazines and in sitcoms and things like that, is always that it's a bad thing and it's a struggle and it's, there's a lot of conflict and so on. I'm not so sure you know, about that. A lot of kids in their 20s really continue to feel very attached to their parents and not in an infantile way at all. They, they, they just they, they love them and they like spending time with them. And so for a lot of those young people, moving back in is not a, a conflict-ridden experience. For some of them it is, but for a lot it's not. Yeah. Well, and archetypally speaking, if you will, I mean, I would, mm-hmm. I would define that as that at some point they have been through a rite of passage or whatever, they've individuated enough, if you will, and in order to come back and be accepted as co-equal. Exactly. And there's not that sort of hierarchical relationship, if you will, anymore. Right. So, so exactly. So if you look at studies that look at parent-child closeness o- over time, what you see is that as people move into and through the first part of adolescence, um, they become more distant from their parents. Um, and then as they start to make the transition into adulthood, they become closer again. And it is coming back in, you know, in, a, different, in, in a different way. And, and actually, I mean, that was my doctoral dissertation was about this very thing, about the fact that as people went through puberty, conflict between them and their parents increased and then peaked kind of, you know, when they were really pubertal, and then it started to decline again. Um, and so it's important for parents struggling with that to know that th- th- their kids will come back emotionally, but, but they're coming back on different terms. They're coming back um, as uh, more like equals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that um, ideally that coming back needs to be ceremonially marked. 
you know, would, would <laughs> in effect the, the parent, ideally, publicly states, you know, huh. I see you as a as a, a full-grown autonomous being capable of making his or her own decisions. And so I will do my best to not infantilize you anymore, right. et cetera, et cetera. You know, and rite of passage is essential for helping with that. Yeah, I, I, I think it is important that parents accept the returning young person as an adult and not continue to treat that person the way that they treated him you know, when he was still a young teenager and, and, and living at home. Yeah, it's so important to the well-being of the youngster as well as for the well-being of the relationship between the two. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, this is all great stuff. You know, you remind... You, I, you, I wish I had you around and it is sort of in my pocket <laughs> all the time that I could say, now what, is, what are the studies on this? <laughs> Uh, you can you can shoot me you can shoot me emails from time to time and I'll tell you what we know you know. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I really fine. do. Thank you. Yeah, because my problem is I think I know a bunch of stuff, but you know I, I haven't studied the science yeah. and I don't really know, or at least not like sure. the way you do. Well, I mean, you know, as a filmmaker, you have done a great job of capturing the stage period, so I think you do know more than you more than you think you know, maybe. Maybe, yeah, maybe. <laughs> or maybe it's implicit knowledge, you know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, talk about for a moment, you know, how communities react to teen <coughs> crimes. Because, you know, if the crimes are drastic enough, the community response, it seems to me, is awful, uh, is often powerful and immediate and effective. And I don't mean necessarily the legal response. I mm -hmm. mean the community response. Like, you know, where, where people will come out and support their neighbors. Uh, so. So how, how, can, how can communities transition to being more proactive with young people rather than being reactive? Well, I think it's important to understand you know, the, the, the causes and origins of youth crime in order to understand our res response to it, in order to tailor you know, a, a better response to it. I mean, a lot of it is born out of deprivation and, and, and wanting. And, um, not being able to find fulfillment in the roles that we expect you to fulfill when you're a young person, which is being a student for the most part. Um, and, and some of it is, um, you know, it, it is peer-influenced behavior because you, maybe you live in a community where this is considered normative, whether it's a, a rite of passage or, you know, or not, but um, you, you might get involved in crime to fit in with the other people that you hang around with. There may be explicit pressure to do that or it may be implied, but nevertheless, it, it happens. Um, so, so I think that when, when communities get, when communities are upset by this and, and are trying to fashion a response to it, they, they need to really sort of think a little bit about what led this person to do this act. Um, you know, historically, the re one of the reasons we have a juvenile justice system that's separate from a criminal justice system is because the juvenile justice system was founded on the idea that we ought to tailor responses on an individual case-by-case -case basis for young people because they do bad things for different reasons. Some of them, you know, are uh, have mental health problems. Um, others are o overly aggressive, and they've been that way since they were little kids. Some were pressured into it by, I mean, it, you know, there's a whole range of reasons. And I think the wisdom of having a separate system for dealing with young people who commit crimes is inheres in, in this idea that we ought to look at you as an individual and figure out what you need to become, you know, better. In Philadelphia and in some other cities, there are community panels that decide what an appropriate response to a juvenile offender is. And, and, and they take the place of, of the, the court system in deciding that response. Now, in, in, in Philly, you, you, you only are eligible to go before one of these community panels if you own up to what you did. So if you say, no, I didn't do it, um, then you've got to go to court and go through the whole you know, um, formal proceeding. Um, but if you said, yes, I did, and if the district attorney thinks you're a good candidate for a more informal response, um, you go before a community panel, um, and it's a public, you know, hearing, and the community decides what what you need to do. And it 
typically would be some kind of community service. Um, and I think there the, the, the understanding is we need to re-engage you in this community in some way. And, 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 and maybe in the best of all worlds, we need to re-engage you in a way that makes you feel like you matter and that you're, that you're part of this community. So, uh, you know, I think that those are good ideas. It, it actually turns out that there are also some youth panels that do this within schools. I mean, they're constituted within schools. Um, and, and the word on them is that they're tougher than adults are. I mean, they're, they're much more punitive in, in the sanctions that they give to each other than, than adults are. I think I remember reading something to that effect in, in, uh, 40 years ago in the Summerhill book about yeah, the Summerhill mm -hmm, right. experience, you know, yeah. uh, that the pure panels were tougher. But I love that example because, in fact, in my film, we're going to have some animation that posits, in effect, different community responses to dysfunctional behavior of, of teens. Right. And it's, it's almost exactly that, where young people are brought before elders in the community. And it's like, rather than being in prison, it's like, well, let's have a conversation here, and uh, and let's figure out what it is that you don't know that you need to know. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Yeah. That's that's great. Um, little Philly. I was born in Philly. Oh, you were? Yeah. Yeah. My parents were from. My mother was born and raised in Strawberry Mansion. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I probably wouldn't recognize it now. Um, I'm it's sure. quite different. Yeah. 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 Um, how are we doing on yeah, time wise here? Oh, we're fine. I yep. think we got like four minutes. <laughs> that, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, you know, well, yeah. Maybe you've touched on this, but let me try to address it from a different angle. I mean, I, I tend to think that this need for initiation is actually maybe not literally biologically encoded at a cellular level, but, but close to that. And, um, you know, wh what happens if, 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 if teens don't get that kind of uh, rite of passage from adults and, and from elders and community? Um, well, I think, I, think, I think most kids get a rite of passage one way or another. Whether it's a good rite of passage or not is, I think, the, the question. Um, so... I think what we've been discussing is um, the, the, the distinction between sort of throwing somebody into adulthood and saying, okay, now do it, right? It's like throwing somebody into the water without teaching them how to swim and say, okay, you figure it out. Um, or whether it's a kind of progressive preparation, you know, under the guidance of somebody who's more experienced in, in which at some point that person says, now you're ready. Or the community says, now you're ready. So um, you, nobody is going to be stuck in perpetual adolescence. Uh, I, I just don't think that that's possible. Sooner or later, um, you're going to get kicked out. And, and actually, in other species, that's what happens. I mean, in primate species, there, there sometimes are juveniles who are reluctant to leave, and they get kicked out. Um, so I, th I think you're going to be kicked out at some point in time. So that I think the issue isn't a rite of passage or not. The issue is how should we structure a rite of passage in modern society that, that both serves the original purpose, which is to, to, to signify to the community and to the young person, him or herself, that this is an adult, that this is an adult who understands what, what place he or she has in the community. So how can we do that in a way that also prepares the person for competent and successful functioning in our society as it exists today. I mean, you know, I think we can learn by looking at indigenous cultures, but we're not that same kind of culture. I mean, we've got to prepare kids to be able to work in the information sector of the economy. So, you know, I'm not sure what an initiation right that does that would, you know, would look like. But it wouldn't look like sending somebody off on a hunting expedition to see, you know, if they come back with something. So I, I think the underlying purpose is probably the same, but I think the way we go about Achieving it is going to be different based on our our needs. You know, what do we need from adults in, in our world? Yeah, I agree with that. I know a few examples like that, though, that are you know modern day 
variations on rites of passage, and they also, besides the information age, I mean, equip young people to live in a very multicultural world. Yeah. You know, which is also an essential. Right, and so we can think about, um, you know, we haven't talked about this at all, but I, I think that there's some value in programs like AmeriCorps um, and the Peace Corps as ways of facilitating the maturation of, of young people into responsible adulthood, where they do uh, learn how to be a part uh, of a community where they're a giver rather than just being a, a taker, w you know, where they're using their skills to help people that are less skilled um, than, than they are. Um, and you know, there are countries that have much higher expectations for community service than, than we do um, in the United States. And maybe that serves a purpose um, not just of, of making somebody feel more a part of the community, but also helping that person become an adult. Absolutely. Yeah, in my view, it's about going from that, what I call the adolescent view of the world, which is me, 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 to us, us, us. Right. And that the vehicle for accomplishing that is service. That you understand that a, a meaningful life is actually about service right. and giving away your gifts to community in meaningful ways, yeah. not taking. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and I, I, I appreciate you bringing that up because, um, uh, well, yeah, I, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you is, is there anything else that you feel like is essential or pertinent to this discussion we're having with Brad? Well, what I thought was most, you know, I, I mentioned when I came in that I, I was almost moved to tears by the trailer. Um, you know, I felt that the that it was it was heart wrenching to see those young people say, "We need adults in our lives to answer questions that we have, um, uh, uh, you know, about these important things that we that we don't know the answers to." Because I think that the that the stereotype of adolescence is that you know they're rebellious and oppositional and they don't want anything to do with adults. And actually what the surveys of kids show is that they want adults to be more involved in their lives, not less involved in their lives. Um, and I, I think that's a really important message to get, you know, to get out there. And the more involvement I, is, is a different kind of involvement as well. Yeah. I think it, it's dependent on authenticity. And right. teens have bullshit detectors exactly. that are yep. well beyond most adults. Yes. And so they just need to be talked to in direct and honest ways. Right. There actually is some research showing that kids um, are, are maybe a little more sensitive than adults are to emotional cues that other people send off. It's a, it's a common experience for parents to say that they were speaking to their teenager in a, what they thought was a calm tone of voice, a reasoned tone of voice when they were irritated by something the teenager had done, and the teenager feels them yelling. Um, and, and that's because they're just super sensitive to social information and emotional information. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. No, sure. This was a lot of fun. Oh, I'm good. glad. Yeah, no, it's been so rich and meaningful. Yeah. Yeah, you know, my, um, yeah, my understanding of so much of parenting is, is, is about saying no. You know, it's setting those boundaries, which is essential, obviously. But at, at some point, if that becomes the substance of that the dialogue. That can't be the. That you can't, you can't have. You know, meaningful relationship. No, no, no. You can't build a relationship around, around saying no all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, kids respond much. I was just on NPR talking about this. Kids respond much more to reward than to punishment. I mean, their brains respond more to reward than punishment. We yeah. now can. We have. Look, you know, a lot of the brain science, and I'm not a neuroscientist. You know, I'm a, I'm a psychologist. Um, the brain science hasn't really taught us anything about how adolescents behave that we didn't know. What it's done is reveal the neural underpinnings of this. But, I mean, my grandmother knew that adolescents, you know, were impulsive and did, did risky things and were sensation seekers. I don't know if this little Russian person could have articulated that that way, but she knew it. Um, you know, and, and so it's fun and interesting to understand how the brain works and to, to confirm that our that some of our stereotypes or ideas about adolescence are, you know, grounded in biology. But, you know, I, I don't think it really changes things that much. Yeah. It certainly doesn't, it, it certainly doesn't give us any particular guidance about what to do. Yeah. No, and that I think you, you pinpointed quite rightly. You know, yeah. it's, we have to figure out a, a, a new 
new and better way of parenting, really. Parenting and, pa- parenting and, and, and schooling. And schooling, yeah. Right. And, and, you know, I mean, the three things that I talk about in the book, you know, are you know, parent, the home, the school, and the community. And we, we need to figure out how all three of those contexts should, should be treating kids in, you know, in, in ways that are consistent with what we know about the science of adolescence, psychological science as well as neuroscience, um, and that help facilitate a healthy transition to kids to, to adulthood. Yeah. But, but, you know, but as I say, and I'm going to say today in my Berkeley talk, um, I, I think we do have to stop thinking about adolescence as a race to see who gets to adulthood. Uh-huh. I, I don't think 